Now I invite you to pray with me and for me, and I invite you just to open up your palms to heaven, and uh, let's invite uh, the Holy Spirit to come. Come, Holy Spirit. Speak to us today. Help us to hear from you. Lord, many of us are carrying heavy burdens today. And help us, the Lord, to put our trust and our confidence in you and help us to lay them down. And may we hear from you as we've heard from you in the music and in the prayer. Speak to us today. And I also pray, Lord, that you would give me the words today. And that this sinful, broken earthen vessel would be able to, in spite of that, be able to speak the good news of your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Quick, uh, just curious if there's any youth or adults that went on the mission trip that are actually here in person today. If so, raise your hand. Yes, all right. We got uh, four. All right, good. We have two youth. Amen. Let's give it up for them. My daughters fell asleep um, I don't know, early, and I think they're still asleep right now. Uh, maybe they're watching online, uh, but I think they're still with bishop pillows and reverend sheets, uh, is what I think. <laughs> when I was a youth director, uh, which was a long time ago, um, one of the games that we regularly played was this game called uh, Would You Rather? And would you rather, it, it had these two situations, and you're supposed to pick which situation you would prefer. And the whole idea behind it is that it was viewed as an icebreaker. Uh, and you were to pick this, or you were to pick that. And so we're going to do this, a, a few of these today. And if you're watching online, I invite you to write your answers online as well. And so here's the first one. Would you rather lounge by the pool or on the beach? Uh, raise your hand if you'd rather lounge by the pool. Raise your hand if you'd rather lounge by the beach. Wow, that was not even close. I was expecting to act a little, bit, a little bit closer. All right, here's the second one. Would you rather wear the same socks for a month or the same underwear for a week? <laughs> now, when I was talking to Adam yesterday, getting the slides ready, he said, do you have to wash them each day? And I said, no, 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 you don't. And so, um, would you rather, who would rather wear the same socks for a month? All right, who would rather wear the same underwear for a week? Well, all right, that's the major, major, uh, minority there. Okay, all right. Would you rather watch nothing but Hallmark Christmas movies or nothing but horror movies? Who would prefer to watch the Hallmark Christmas movies? Do any men have their hands raised up? Yes, we have a few. We have a few, yes. And who would rather watch the horror movies? All right, and then here's the last one that we'll do here. Would you rather find a rat in your kitchen or a roach in your bed. <laughs> Who would rather have a rat in your kitchen? Wow, I thought everybody's gonna go the other way with this. Who'd rather have the roach in your bed? I will, oh my goodness, I will pray for the kitchen people. <laughs> so you get the gist of the game, the gist of the game just to create conversation. And I believe in this chapter, the writer of Ecclesiastes does a version of this game. Uh, and we're going to go through that in a few minutes. But before I do that, I want to remind you a little bit about what Josh has talked about the last two weeks. And Josh, uh, in week one, we talked about some of the theories about the reason for writing uh, this book. Um, and one theory, and the one that he ascribes and that I ascribe to as well, is that the writer of the book is writing this book as a warning. The writer is saying, learn from me. I've experienced life I've made mistakes, and instead of making the same mistakes that I've made, learn from me. Do things differently as I would do them differently if I had the opportunity. That's what the writer is saying. Learn from me. Now, if you've ever asked anyone what kind of life they would desire to have, nobody says, give me a mediocre life, right? Nobody says, give me a lousy life. The answer to that question is, I always want to have a good life. And what the writer of Ecclesiastes, I believe, is trying to convey in his book 
is that how do we have a good life? And he tries to answer that question. Going back to the ancient Greeks, philosophers have argued that the good life should be our aim. Hedonism was the was the philosophical I can't even say the word <laughs> philosophical school that articulated this view. Articulated this view. Hedonism believed that the chief purpose of human life is to experience as much pleasure as possible and to minimize pain. Have as much pleasure as possible and to minimize pain. I believe there are a lot of us here today that like that idea, right? We want to have as much pleasure as possible and we want as little pain as possible. And this is often considered the, the, the path of the good life. There's also the common assumption that if you can accumulate material possessions, if you have enough wealth, and if you can save enough for retirement, you will experience the good life that everybody wants. The writer of Ecclesiastes understood this, and as he looked back on his life, the teacher explained that he had tried to fill his life with every pleasurable experience. Only near the end of his life did he realize that it all was meaningless. And so many of these things that he had been chasing uh, were meaningless, and it was like he was chasing after the wind. And so he's trying to help us. But it seems today that people still miss this lesson. I read about a study recently involving 120 people who on average earn $25 million a year. These multimillionaires were asked questions about such things as whether they thought they had enough, if they felt secure, and if they were experiencing the good life based on their standards of living. The consistent answer to that question was no. The average of 25 million these people had. And they did not feel they were experiencing the good life. So many of us think if we got to that $25 million mark, we'd be having the good life. Amen. Amen. I say to my middle brother, um, Frankie, all the time, he says he, just how he would like to be rich. And I said, you know, it's not going to make you happy. And he says back to me, I would like to find out. <laughs> <laughs> and I think a lot of us would like to find that out. So the second question these, mil these multimillionaires were asked was, how much more income would you need to have in order to feel like you were secure? And the an average answer to that question was if they could have 25% more they feel secure. So these people with an average worth of $25 million wanted another uh, $6.25 million, million to feel secure. That's crazy, right? Most of us here today, we'd probably say if we had 25% more, we'd probably feel secure. That 25% just keep, it's like the fill gold posts. They just keep moving, right? They just keep moving. For those of us that don't have annual incomes and the millions, the answer in this survey may seem absurd. We would enjoy the challenge of finding satisfaction on a $25 million annual budget. But that's just chasing after the wind on a bigger scale. As we look back on the past 50 years in the United States, in much the same way the teacher in Ecclesiastes reflected on his own experience, we can see what has happened when people have tried the counterfeit path to the good life. During the past five decades, the gross domestic product of the United States per person has roughly increased by a factor of two. America's standard of living has gone up dramatically. The average new home 50 years ago was one-third the size of an average new home today. And then listen to this. Yet studies say that we are actually 3% less happy than we were 50 years ago. Clearly having more wealth and more possessions hasn't led to more satisfaction in our lives. And yet, one of the top answers, what it would take for you to be more satisfied is what? More money. I didn't know this, but every year since 2012, the United Nations has issued a study called the World Happiness Report. They surveyed thousands of people in 50 different countries, attempting to find out how many people in those countries and what factors make them happy. In the first report, the United States, States ranked 23rd in terms of overall happiness with their lives. The people of the wealthiest nation in the history of the world were 23rd 
on the happiness scale. Just think about that. The people of the wealthiest nation in the world rank behind a number of much less prosperous nations, including Malaysia, Tanzania, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, and El Salvador. Good news, though, in subsequent years, the United States has moved up a few spots and is about to crack the top 20. I read an article written by a successful entrepreneur and was struck by what she said. At the height of my success, I was actually pretty miserable. I'm not saying there's an inverse relationship between success and happiness, just that they're not act there's not necessarily a positive one. There are two very different things. Achieving success is not the same as achieving happiness or experiencing the good life. Where do we turn after we realize that success is not the same thing as happiness? Maybe we need to redefine what the good life means. And I'm thinking that this is what the teacher is trying to get across to us. The teacher is trying to convey their wisdom to us so that we can have the ex experience the good life. Isn't it mind-boggling to think that we live in the wealthiest nation in the world and yet our happiness level is 23rd. It's stunning. But if you look around, you can probably see why we are ranked that number. Now, what I'm going to do is we're going to get back to the would you rather game with some of what the proverb writer writes. And one of the things we need to know that one of the communication styles that is still actually done today is, uh, is um, hyperbole. You say, you exaggerate something to make your point. I don't know if you do this or not, but Jesus did this. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, it's better for you to cut out your eye than to lust after somebody. Do you really think Jesus wanted us to cut our eyes out? <laughs> right? No, he did not. If so, there would there'd be people with no eyes. Uh, many, uh, everybody would be blind, right? He says it's better to cut your hand off than to steal. Do you think Jesus really wanted us to cut our hands off? Help me out here. No, he did not. It's a communication style. He was exaggerating something to make a point. As we go through what the writer of Ecclesiastes says today, I want you just to remember that. Because I think he's trying to get his point across by making some statements that are very big. You with me? So we're going to play this game with the, the writer of Ecclesiastes a little bit, and uh, just and go, we'll go from there. So here's the first one. Would you rather be a person of honor and not live in luxury, or live in luxury without honor? All right. Be honest if, you, if you're up for it. Raise your hand if you'd rather be a person of honor. All right. Raise your hand if you'd rather be a person without honor, but live in luxury. No honest people here. Okay, that's a good, that's good. Well, hopefully everybody's being truthful. Yeah, Ecclesiastes 7.1 says this, A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. Now, this chapter, there's a lot of talking about parties. Um, and actually, um, what would often happen when, uh, during this time period when this was written, if you would go to a party, the host of the party would put perfume uh, on your forehead. They would anoint you with perfume. I, and so, and uh, the richer you were, the more expensive the perfume was, and, and all that stuff. And so I just think it's important to, to understand kind of the context that's going here. And so the teacher begins uh, and ends this section, uh, verse 14 is the last verse, with a rationale that wisdom is better than wealth. Honor is better than luxury for the simple reason that reputations last longer than a lifetime. One may have luxury in life, but that luxury ends at death. And I know you've all seen the thing before where it says, um, you can't take it with you when you die, right? Ecclesiastes wants to remind us that we are mortal. And as Josh talked about last week, that we are temporary. That our time here is, is set. It's, it's not for an eternity. But we do have an eternity, and that eternity is for an eternity. But we're only here for a few short decades. Luxury is temporary. Honor is eternal. Next one. And again, would you rather go to a funeral or a party? Raise your hand if you'd rather go to a funeral. 
And I got one back there, that's good. Raise your hand if you'd rather go to a party. Yeah. I agree with you guys, amen? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, as somebody that I might be the only person in here, um, I could be wrong, that's probably been to more funerals than parties. Uh, and I'd rather, rather go to a party. Um, but look at what, what, he says, what the writer says in 7.2. It's better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so the living should take this to heart. And so again, I think he's over-exaggerating to get his point across. Uh, mourning is an outward expression of an inward sorrow or grief. The teacher reminds us that we are not able to party all the time. People who often will let's say you have a party and you invite them over, people will come for the enjoyment. They might not even be coming for you, amen? They might just be coming for a good time. They might not even know you. They just heard the word party and they wanted to show up. However, that is different when you go to a place of mourning. Unlike at a party, a person may go to comfort people who are going through grief. The friends who come to the house of mourning show that they are truly friends. They want them to know they care. Parties can often be very shallow. Funerals often have a great depth to them. And you can leave a funeral wanting to be a better person. But you probably won't leave the party wanting to be a better person. That is why it is better. The next one, again, I'm a little, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm sure we're all going to be on the same agreement with this. Would you rather cry or laugh? Raise your hand if you'd rather cry. Raise your hand if you'd rather laugh. Yeah, amen. I, I, yes, laughing is like one of my favorite things. Uh, the writer writes in 7, 3, and 4, frustration. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool only thinks about having a good time. So to me, these two are kind of tied together, the, this one and the previous one. And again, when we think about death, he wants us to be reminded that that's going to happen to us. And not to ignore that fact, but to come to an understanding that that's a part of life. And to follow up the previous better then is the, is the reason why mourning can be better. We can gain more wisdom from going to one funeral than we do by going to a whole, whole year's worth of parties. Learning to deal with death can be good for the heart and good for our quality of life. And the teacher mentions this repeatedly in verses 2 through 4. Dealing with death and all its sorrow helps us to understand life, makes us better people, helps us to figure out what's important, makes us wiser people. Whenever I do a service, a funeral service, particularly if the person is younger, the first thing I want to do after the service is just drive home and hug my kids. Because life is fragile. And it can be gone in a blink of an eye. And so it can show us what's important. I want to show this video, um, and you can go ahead and start playing it. I'm going to talk over it a little bit, but I invite you to, to watch the video. And this is um, the fourth grade teacher um, at Robb Elementary where the shooting took place and this is the teacher that got shot and he had several surgeries and he came home and when he came home there was a caravan of cars to greet him and to just welcome him home in the midst of this tremendous grief uh, that was shared and uh, some of they eventually start getting out of the car and they start giving him gifts but when you watch this it just shows you the emotion, it shows you the connection. It shows you the power that we have in sorrow and in grief that you can't necessarily get from going to a party. And this one lady here in a moment is the uh, mother of the ten, one of the 10 year old daughters in his class that died. And when they have this embrace, it's just, um, 
every time I watch it, I just kind of get some mist in my eyes. And I think this is kind of what the writer of Ecclesiastes is wanting us to understand about the power of sorrow, the power of grieving, the power of loss. And how as bad and awful as it can be can help us be better people. And so I just wanted you to, to get a look at that, and uh, I'll tell you when that lady, when the mom's coming up, because I want you to see that part. Um, I think it's at the two-minute mark, and unfortunately, I probably just need to talk for a few more seconds, so I'll just watch it with you, actually, for a second until she comes up. But just all the way that all these people are loving uh, this teacher. This is the mom of the shoe lost a 10-year-old daughter in his class. And he tells her that he's actually sorry. I think that's good, Adam. So when the writer writes, um, would you rather go to a funeral or a party, or would you rather cry or laugh, and he chooses the absurd answer to that question, I'm thinking that this is kind of what he has in mind. This helps us understand the importance of living a truly good life, and not a life that is chasing after the wind. The writer continues, and this is our next, would you rather. Would you rather be criticized by a wise person or praised by a fool? And verse 5 and 6 says this, Better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. A fool's laughter is quickly gone like thorns crackling in a fire. This also is meaningless. The praise of fools doesn't accomplish anything more than puff a person up, build them up. However, it doesn't make the person better. When somebody is corrected by a wise person, if the one who is corrected would listen, they'll be able to grow, they'll be able to learn. The hard part with this, better than, is to discover that correction helps me more than a praise. So often we want the feedback that we did a great job. But if we really want to grow, we really want to get better, and whatever it is that we do, we sometimes need that correction. Correction is a form of encouragement. When we rebuke someone, it should always be to make the person better. So if somebody does something that you don't like, maybe it's at work, maybe it's a child, maybe it's a spouse, though you've know, you got to be very careful with that, amen, right? Um, when you go to that person, don't just say, Oh, that's horrible. But figure out a way to do that in a way that is offering advice about how to do it better. You don't want to just criticize somebody, but you also want to show them an opportunity as to how they can become a better person to correct a fall, to teach a lesson, to improve something. Correction can be encouraging and healing, and that is why it is better than praise. But correction can help me do something maybe I could do in an even better way. All right, two more left here. Would you rather be patient or prideful? And I'm not even going to ask because hopefully everybody would pick patient. Amen. The writer writes in 7 through 10, Extortion turns wise people into fools, and bribes corrupt the heart. Finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than pride. Control your temper, for anger, anger labels you a fool. Don't long for the good old days. This is not wise. As we go through these verses here, we see how pride can interrupt patience. The end of a matter is better than the beginning of a thing, because I learned patience in doing that. If you don't ever finish it, you never get that patience. Extortion and bribes are just shortcuts to the end. This is why patient spirit is better than a proud spirit. 
If I become proud, I can easily become angry because things don't go my way. If I'm angry about a matter, it means that I don't learn patience, but that I am relying upon my pride. When I look back to the formal, former days, I'm relying upon my pride and not my patience because I believe that my past is better than my present. Pride leads to a negative outlook. Patient teaches me to endure because I believe that my future is better than my past. Patient leads me to a positive outlook. And then the last one. Would you have, rather have wisdom or wealth? We're going to do a test on this one. Who would rather have wisdom? Raise your hand. Who would rather have wealth? All right, good answer, good answer. I love uh, the beginning of verse 11. Wisdom is even better when you have money, amen? <laughs> Why not have both, right? If all this wisdom is great, but if you have wisdom and the money, then that's awesome. Both are a benefit as you go through life. Wisdom and money can get you almost anything, and that is so true. But only wisdom can save your life. As we saw earlier, this section begins and ends with the idea that wisdom is better than wealth, honor is better than luxury. Wisdom and money both protect a person. However, wisdom defines a person more than the things a person actually accumulates. And I said this was the last one, but I actually have one last one, and it's this one. Would you rather have earthly treasures or heavenly treasures? Verses 13 through 14, the writer says, Accept the way God does things, for who can straighten what he has made crooked? Enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in life. That's why we're to cherish every day, amen? That's why we're to live every day to, our, to its fullest. Jesus says a very similar thing in the Sermon on the Mount where he says it rains on the just and the unjust. And it also reminded me of something else Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, verses um, 19 through 20, uh, chapter 6. This is what Jesus says. Do not store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break out and steal. The reason that wisdom is better than wealth is because the heavenly is better than the earthly. And so as you think about your life, are you more focused on the earthly or the heavenly? And what the writer is trying to convince us of is that it's the heavenly, it's the eternal, that we need to be focused on, not the earthly. The idea of the writer of the book is this, is a warning. Learn from me. This past week was, a, again, a great week for me personally and I believe for our church as we were in Philadelphia working um, in many different ways. Um, Lynn Stewart, a member of our church, uh, her and I, um, they divide all the churches up, and so we had a group of about 15 that went to um, Roosevelt Elementary and Middle School. They had kindergarten through eighth grade, I believe, there. And our project was to try to beautify the school. And the school, like, it just had ivy that had grown over the walls. There's a lot of trash, and, and so we... we the bulk of our time was cleaning up the school to get it ready for August when it starts. And the organization that we worked with is that what they try to do at the Fuge Camps, they try to match you up with organizations that are already doing things. They're not there to start new things. And so the ministry that we worked with were men who care, men who care of Germantown. And uh, here's the picture uh, with four of us. Um, I didn't want to be in the picture, but they told me to get in the picture, so I got in the picture. Uh, and uh, two men to, um, your, to your left uh, is Joe and Steve. Uh, Joe is actually, the, um, I believe, the chairman or, or the leader of this committee. And what this group done, it's been around for, uh, I think, about 13 years now, is they got together because they were tired of seeing the direction that their town in Philadelphia was going. 
And so they started getting together a group of men. There's also a sister organization. You want to guess what it's called? Yes, sisters or women of, uh, of Germantown. And they do the same thing. They, uh, they get together to try to be a blessing to their community because there's drugs, there's gun violence, um, all kinds of things going on. And so this organization, they, what they try to do is they get the members of the organization to give one hour a week to their organization. One hour a week. Go to the next slide. It's the back of the T-shirt. I wanted you to see it. Uh, serving the community, I cut off the wire. That's my photo problem. Uh, please contact us to support our annual events, annual scholarship programs, community resource center, restoring Roosevelt Community Festival bowling party. Thank you for supporting men who care of Germantown. Go back one slide if you don't mind. Um, I was talking to Steve, who was our primary contact, and that's the guy directly beside me, about this program, and I asked him why he does it. And he said, this is what I was created to do. He could be doing other things. He could be doing other things, you know, that were about him and his family. But he wants to be a blessing to his community. He wants to make his community a better place. He wants to make the world a better place. And the last thing he said to me when I asked him that question that I'll never forget is, he says, I'm going to do this until I die. He is seeking heavenly treasures, not earthly treasures. What about you? Are you more concerned about your earthly treasures? Now, earthly treasures are important. Amen. We need a home. Amen. Amen. Or are you more concerned about your heavenly treasures? Are you more concerned about the temporary? Or are you more concerned about the internal? Where is your focus? What Steve taught me this week and reminded me this week is that we need to be focused on our heavenly treasures. Our heavenly treasures should trump our earthly treasures. And I really think that's what the writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to share with us. If you want the good life, it's not about the earthly treasures. That's what the world tells us, and that's what we often think. But that is not how you have the good life. The way you have the good life is by giving yourself away, is by serving your community, is by serving your church, by serving your God. Do you want a good life? The answer is not more. The answer is to seek God first in His kingdom. And then all these things will be given unto you. Got a few next steps and we'll be done. And I am preaching very long today. I apologize. Here's the first one. What is your level of commitment right now? Contentment, not commitment. What is your level of contentment? Are you happy? Do you have joy in your life? Are you sad? Are you miserable? Why or why not? What is your level of contentment right now? Secondly, what, how would you define the good life? To you, Personally, how would you define the good life? And then compare and contrast it with what I'm saying today and see if you're buying what I'm selling. And then lastly, in what ways are you storing up heavenly treasures? Earthly treasures, heavenly treasures, where are you? Let's pray, and as I pray, I invite Michael to come on up. It will lead us into a time of prayer. And uh, you can light some candles, fill out some prayer cards. And at home, we invite you to submit your prayer requests and use this as a time of prayer as well. And, um, and so I invite you to be a part of, uh, to pray with us. And you might pray about whatever burdens in your heart, but also pray about your treasure and where it is. Let's pray. 
Most gracious love and Lord, we love you. We thank you for this writer of Ecclesiastes who says some very interesting things. Where are we focused, Lord? Are we focused on the heavenly or the earthly? Hear us now as we reflect and we pray on that. Let us pray.